Welcome everyone. In this chapter, we'll be discussing about transfer conveyors. What are the type of transfer conveyors and how we can design them. So stay tuned for all the information. What are transfer conveyors? When we have two different conveyors, this is our incoming conveyor and this is our outgoing conveyor. And we have our component coming from this side and we want to send it in a perpendicular direction. In that case, we will be needing a mechanism which can take up the pallet from this conveyor and can transfer to this conveyor. So this is done by transfer conveyor. When we have different type of arrangements like perpendicular conveyor, parallel conveyor or an exit location. I will explain in detail. This is our incoming conveyor. This is outgoing conveyor. For this motion, perpendicular motion, we need a transfer conveyor. Likewise, if we have parallel conveyors and we want to transfer pallet from this to this location, in this case, we will be deploying two transfer conveyors. One is A, one is B. A is on the giving end and B is on the taking end. Then we have a situation in which we want to take out the component from the assembly line or from any type of conveyor and we have an exit location where we have a trolley park or maybe a table. So transfer conveyor can be used in that case where we want to take the pallet which is moving in a certain direction and we want to take it out from that conveyor. So these are the typical conditions in which transfer conveyor can be used. There are other applications also. So what are the mechanism or what are the different types of transfer conveyor? One is the belt type conveyor in which belt is responsible for transferring. Then we have roller type in which rollers are used for transferring the pallet or the component in the direction. We have chain type and then we have omni wheel. Omni wheel is quite new and it can transfer in various directions. So that will be discussed in detail in another chapter. For the timing, we'll stick to these three types of conveyors. About ideas made reality. We provide design and development for the complete machine, industrial automation and special purpose equipment. In addition, we provide mechanical and electrical design outsourcing and we work on various platforms like AutoCAD, SolidEdge, SolidWorks, ROE, ePlan. We also help startups in their prototype development and proof of concept development. If you have any design requirement, feel free to contact us. And don't forget to subscribe and like this video. We'll be taking an example of chain type transfer conveyor and we'll be discussing in detail. The same principle can be used for designing roller as well as belt conveyor. So what is the working principle and what are the various parts in a transfer conveyor? So we have an incoming conveyor, we have an outgoing conveyor and we have a transfer conveyor. Then we have a lifting mechanism. Let's explain them in more detail. In this diagram, I'll be explaining the working principle of transfer conveyor. So this is our normal conveyor. It can be any type of conveyor, roller, chain, belt. And this is the transfer station installed inside the conveyor. So the normal conveyor has this level, whereas our transfer conveyor is resting at a bottom location. So pallet is basically moving on these rollers, let's say, and our transfer conveyor, which can move perpendicular to this screen, is resting at this location. Component stops at this location and this moves up and takes the component to this location. This is the new TDC or top dead center or top level of conveyor. When it is when the pallet or component is at this level, it is free from conveyor underneath it. Then the mechanism whichever is deployed in this conveyor starts moving and pallet is transferred in the desired direction. So the only principle which is deployed is here take out the pallet or the component from the existing conveyor so that it can be cross transferred. So as I explained working principle and what are the different types there is a lifter assembly and there is a conveyor assembly. We'll be discussing all these parts in detail and how to design them. How to design various components of a transfer conveyor. 
we'll be discussing about gene selection motor selection and 3d design coming to the gene selection let's write down the specification for which we'll be designing the conveyor this is the pallet weight width length height payload accumulation feature is not required in a transfer conveyor this is the required speed conveyor length conveyor station since we are designing only for one station this is the case pitch of station and maximum number of pallets the same principle can be used for designing any chain conveyor even if it is 10 meter long or have a multiple component on it you just need to put the values and same principle will be used for any chain conveyor coming to the chain selection so step one is to check the convenience condition so what is the type of conveyor what is the direction of chain travel in this case it will mostly be horizontal type mass and size of material to be conveyed conveyor capacity interval between conveying objects this will be required for defining the chain duty and motor duty conveying speed conveying length lubrication status which is very important this affects the coefficient of friction which can increase or decrease the motor power consideration of environmental condition because we don't want to deploy those materials which can get rusted in harsh environmental condition so we have to take care of that also in healthcare and pharmaceutical sector we have to be very cautious while selecting materials step 2 is tentatively selecting a chain based on the pulling load so how we do that we need weight of the component coefficient of friction for chain conveyor will be considering 0.2 speed factor and from this formula which is nothing but weight coefficient of friction speed coefficient and g which for converting this to the si unit and divided by 1000 because we are calculating in kilonewton so deploying this formula we get this value since we have two strands of chain we will be multiplying this by 0.6 because it will be a hypothetical condition where both the chains are sharing equal load our component might not be symmetric our pallet might not be symmetric or the cg might 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 not lie in the center so there will always be more load on the chain as a conservative or more realistic approach we multiply it by 0.6 after multiplying by 0.6 we get 0.24 kN the chain we have selected is of size 40 and allowable load is 2.67 kN though it is very high at the later stage i'll be explaining why i have taken this to brief it i have taken such a strong chain just because i want more stability underneath my pallet and to reduce the wear and tear so the factor of safety is coming out to be 11.13 which is quite high if taken the requirement which we have mentioned in the beginning this is the chain specification which we have selected size 40 chain now checking the allowable load in some cases we have attachment chains and in some cases we have normal chains if we have attachment chain then we have to calculate the load for attachments also so how much load is applied and what is the maximum allowable load for that attachment in this case we don't have any attachment so we'll be checking directly the roller load how we do that we take the pallet length divided by pitch into 2 because there are two strands of chain we want to calculate how many rollers will be sharing the load so this is the total weight and load we calculate is for per roller which is just dividing this by total number of rollers now allowable load load on roller is 65 kg for 40 size chain in step 4 we will be validating what we have calculated so far for this we will be needing maximum static load which we have already calculated conveying speed which is input center distance between sprocket vertically which is zero center distance between sprocket which we have assumed as 1 meter is the length of conveyor we have taken as at 0.9 
then center between the distance between sprocket which is same as this then mass of moving part which we have from the beginning in the later stage we will be calculating the motor power coefficient of friction as we discussed earlier it is 0.2 and the transmission efficiency is 85 percent so this is the formula which we will be using and deploying this formula we get the result of 0.3359 kilo newton so per chain again multiplying it by 0.6 we get 0.2 so deploying the power formula, we got the power as 0.131. At the later stage, we'll be again validating motor power. Now determining the chain size, we calculated the F in previous step. We'll be multiplying it by velocity factor. Multiplying it by the coefficient of velocity, we get this force as 0.2418 kilo newton. Again, the maximum allowable load is 2.65 for size 40 chain and hence the selection is OK. At the same time, I have selected a sprocket also with number of tooth as 40 and PCD 121.5 mm. Coming to the motor selection. For motor selection, we need angular velocity. We know the linear velocity is 20 from previous inputs and radius of sprocket which we have calculated so we get the omega which is the angular velocity coming out to be 5.48 radian per second. Converting it to RPM, we apply omega here, multiply it by 60 because we want to convert in meter per minute and divide it by 2 pi. So this gives us the desired RPM of motor. Now torque required can simply be calculated by multiplying force by radius. To calculate the radius, we'll do PCD by 2, which is pitch circle diameter of the sprocket divided by 2. We get this as torque required. Multiplying by friction factor of 0.1, force required comes out to be 22.44 Newton meter. It is always important to look for units. I have seen people making a lot of mistake in getting confused in units. So it's always to stick to one method of Calculating if you are using meter per minute, stick to it or meter per second, stick to it. Now calculating the power is T into omega or you can do T 2 pi n by 60 n is the RPM. Omega is the angular velocity. So it will be the same. It will not make any difference. Multiplying it by efficiency because every transmission has certain losses. So power required come out to be. 0.132 now we have to add certain factor into it because it will be working 24 hour let's say 290 days a year so we have to factor in that as well to factor in that we need a service factor of 1.35 you can get these values from the motor manufacturer cattle from chain calculation we got this value and by validation, we got this value, which are, as you can see, quite close to each other. So speed required is this, torque required is this, power required and service factor. These are the main parameters you will be needing for deciding on motor specification. There are certain more things like uh, how motor will be mounted, where the terminal box will be, what is the energy rating you will be needing. So this will, that we will discuss in a separate chapter. To rudimentary select a motor, these are the specifications you will be needing. So I have selected 0.18 kilowatt motor because this is the best combination I could get which is closer to this number. So far we have selected chain and motor. So we will be moving further to the 3D modeling and construction part. In this I will be explaining all the parts of this conveyor. So let's move to it. This is how a transfer conveyor looks like in a real life situation. We have two parallel accumulation conveyor and we want to transfer this pallet from location A to location B. For this, two transfer conveyor have been deployed, one at the station A, one at the station B. As soon as the pallet stops at this location, this is lifted up, 
and move to station B with the help of this, these chains and one underneath this. Let's discuss in detail about this element or uh, this conveyor section. This is how a typical arrangement looks like. Let's start from bottom. These are the two cylinders which are responsible for lifting this chain conveyor. These are lifting this plate on which this complete conveyor is mounted with the help of aluminium sections. In some arrangement, instead of two cylinder, a single cylinder is also used, which is placed in the center and all four corners we have guide rods. Such an arrangement is required when the eccentric load is much higher and these cylinders are not capable of taking that much eccentric load. When you will select this cylinder in the catalog of the manufacturer, you will get all the eccentric load values. Moving up, we have a regular chain conveyor. Let's take a sectional view of this drive assembly. We have motor, drive shaft, then we have our bearing arrangement, spacers which are responsible for keeping the chain sprocket in center. The power is transmitted from this shaft to this sprocket with the help of a key. On the other hand, we have the similar arrangement with spacers, bearing set and sprocket. Moving to the driven end, this section is free to slide forward and reverse when we have loosened these bolts. With the help of these two adjuster bolts, we can move this assembly forward or bring it reverse and can tighten or loosen the chain. It is quite simple. Let's have a look at the driven assembly section. It is quite similar to the drive assembly Instead of the entire shaft, we just have a rotating pin. So it can idle on this shaft as it is mounted on these bearings. Another interesting thing is the guide assembly. These guides can be moved up or down, forward or reverse to adjust as per the width and height of pallet. This is a more universal assembly and instead of making it universal, you can make it specific to your application as well. If you are wondering how we can calculate this shaft, the plate thickness, the fastener size or all other small component of this assembly, we will be making separate videos or we will be making many separate videos for all these parts. So do subscribe if you want to watch all these videos in future. So thank you for your time. Thank you.